Good evening. I would like to recognize the members of the family, Madame Phoebe Girwell. I would like to recognize the members of the foundation, the vice chancellor of the University of Western Cape, our gracious host. I see also present the vice chancellor of UCT and other distinguished members of academia. I would like to thank the presentations by the representatives of the CAMPI. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to be asked to deliver this commemorative lecture honoring the life of Dr. Jakes Gerwell, a principled man with the courage to match his noble ideals. In no small way, while facing the challenges of his time, he wrote a wonderful chapter in the history of New South Africa. Let us remember his assertiveness in wanting to ensure all Africans, regardless of race and ethnicity, would have an opportunity to be educated. He believed it was not only important to understand the world, but also to change it. It reminds me of similar public intellectuals, such as Edward Said, Franz Fanon, or Amilcar Cabral, my own, that placed an enormous importance on the contextualization of liberation and freedom struggles through knowledge, culture, and education. Gerwell's call for clear understanding, profound understanding, mirrors the same deep appreciation of the importance of making us better, not just freer. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe, like the mythical Sakofa bird symbol, one needs to look into one's past in order to construct a promising future. Pan-Africanism brought much celebrated political liberation that saw Africa overcome domination and oppression by ending colonialism and apartheid on the continent. But it is time that we admit that perhaps we celebrated too quickly those achievements. The reality is that despite decades of independence, the daily lives confronting Africa have not dealt a blow to poverty, widening inequalities, unemployment, hunger, and human insecurity. We have no reason to be ashamed of the good. Some achievements are startling. With triple GDP in the last 20 years, achieved amazing gains on health and education, improved governance, created the second most attractive region for investment, and saw a reduction of poverty despite a demographic explosion that has created the fastest growing urbanization drive in human history. It is natural, therefore, that we become more ambitious, bolder, and capable of articulating a long-term vision. But the point remains, nevertheless. Are we going to construct this bright future with or without a new sense of humanism and fraternity? There resides whatever value we can attribute to a Pan-African project. I will try to respond to this rhetorical question with frankness. The philosophical underpinnings of humanism refer us to humankind's desire and increased ability to rely on its own resources to master the forces of nature and turn it into its own advantage and its association with the moral sphere of human existence in answer to the perennial question of how we should best live. The 20th century has reshaped the meaning of humanism to encompass the broad and rising social movement that promotes humanistic values and counters the impersonal and destructive forces of humankind's inhumanity 
against itself. Humanism is opposed to war, tyranny, unjust and oppressive political systems, hierarchy, autocracy, inhumane treatment of people, and any policy role or institutions that are detrimental to human dignity, integrity, and well-being. Humanists posit the existence of a community that binds every individual to all others. The concept of an African humanism cannot be any different. In South Africa, the idea of humanism is referred to as Ubuntu. It represents a philosophy centered on collective will, the principle that humans cannot live in isolation and don't even exist without the other. Desmond Tutu, who graced the previous Kerwell lecture, sees Ubuntu as the essence of being human. How does humanism coexist with the Pan-African ideal? Historical examination of Pan-Africanism can lead us to three key periods that shaped our understanding of what it means. The first wave starts outside the continent, where after the abolition of slavery, Africans in the diaspora were looking for an identity. Who, we, we, who are we? Where did we come from? And most importantly, how do we find our roots? This became the impetus for the Pan-African Congresses, the Harlem Renaissance of Culture and Arts, or the Blackness Movement, with several newspapers that focused on identity consciousness, such as Présence Africaine, launched in Paris by Alion Diop, Negro World by Marcus Garvey, or the crisis by William Du Bois. This period became known for the firming up of consciousness, the identity of one's blackness, and the creation of several concepts around the issue of identity of blacks. In this mix were also African students who on scholarship to study in the countries of their colonial masters, easily identify themselves with the same causes. These African students would mostly end up playing a key role in transporting these newborn ideas to the continent. The institutions of this time were faced with limited mobilization, poor representation, and inadequate resources. These institutions were based on passion, a strong belief in the cause of total emancipation and, and also on courage. They made the dream of independence become attainable and influenced the ideology of the liberation movements that fought for such an objective. The second wave of Pan-Africanism occurs during the period of euphoria that come with the independence of the 60s in their aftermath the leaders of the Pan-African movement metamorphosed into political leaders of the newly independent African states, or were advisors to the same. We know Du Bois, for example, relocated to Ghana as a special guest of President Kwame Nkrumah and director of Encyclopedia Africana, a project he could not finish before his death. Others, such as George Padmore, or Ras Mekonen held positions of power in the newly independent states. The move from consciousness to affirmation was driven by African intellectuals who were in leadership positions in the continent. The Organization of African Unity, established 25th May 63 in Addis Ababa with 32 signatories symbolizes the appeal of the Pan-African ideal. Though the creation of this body was originally fraught with conflict, it never flinched on its focus for the total liberation of the continent. The third and most recent wave is epitomized by the transformation of the OAU into the African Union. What is significantly different between the two is a new focus on development and a shift more recently articulated towards transformation. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Pan-Africanism as an intellectual concept is at best misunderstood and at worst confusing. Several competing but similar meanings were given to the concept throughout its history. Nowadays, most see Pan-Africanism as encompassing the process that make a constellation of African states an economically viable and integrated entity. It is remarkable how the concept remains alive when it is so ill-defined. It is attractive to academics, policymakers, and activists alike, so much so that as the AU celebrated 50 years of African institutional history in 2013, the theme chosen was obviously Pan-Africanism and African Renaissance. To understand this continuous attraction, maybe it would help to take a detour and revisit the concept of Orientalism. In his 1978 groundbreaking book, Orientalism, Palestinian author Edward Said postulated that the term Orientalism as a classification was a fabrication of Western intellectuals in their quest to define the myriad of groups, religions, and nations in the Middle East. This classification sets out to mark the people of the Middle East in a stereotypical way. This classification, nevertheless, took hold to the point the classified start using and owning it, given their own need for alterity. In an ironic twist, the term Pan-Africanism was created by blacks and Africans in the diaspora as a means of self-classification and alterity as well. It was an indirect response to Egel, the German philosopher, depiction of Africans a people without history. In a way, Orientalism and Pan-Africanism correspond to similar needs and provoked similar identity calls. To this day, the process of correcting the wrong and harmful prejudices against Africans is not over and may be well responsible for the appeal of the Pan-African ideology. No matter how it is defined, until Africans are persuaded their negative stereotyping is over, Pan-Africanism is likely to be a great mutant to build self-confidence. Yet, Africa's narrative is changing. There is no doubt that the continent has stepped into a new and higher growth trajectory. However, who is currently writing the Africa story? To a large extent, it continues to be driven externally. It is also often not a consensual story as it emanates from either business eagerness or stereotypical perceptions of Afro-stigmatism that continue to persist despite economic strides made. These views are increasingly patronizing and out of touch, posing a deterrent to new interest and opportunity and irritating Africans to the core. American bestseller writer Paul Theroux, recent offering about Africa, and the title of the book is The Last Train to Zona Verde, Overland from Cape Town to Angola, is an attempt to assess just what the 21st century has done to Africa. The book is an example of Afro-pessimism at its best, laced with poor stereotypical descriptions and contradictions in a bid to live an African fantasy. For example, describing a group of Kunk people of Northeast Namibia, Teru indulges in describing them as, and I quote, mostly naked men and women, an infant with a head like a fuzzy fruit bobbing in one woman's sling. 
men in leather clothes, clutching spears and bows. End of quote. Someone familiar with the place actually knows these are stage scenes to show folkloric Africa. His description is so daunting, archaic, and cliche that the readers may think they are reading the works of an early 20th century author, maybe Joseph Conrad, or indeed some speech from King Leopold I of Belgium, the then personal owner of the Congo. Perhaps the pathetic undertones are not surprising given that the author's own mortality is a recurrent theme. Paul Theroux concludes, and I quote, I had nothing to complain about but the misery of Africa, the awful, poisoned, populous Africa, the Africa of the cheated, despised, and accommodated people of seemingly unfixable blight, so hideous, really, it is unrecognizable as Africa at all. But it is, of course, the new Africa, end of quote. The last train to Zona Verde is no doubt an uncompromising, unsettling work. But it is a bestseller, even in exclusive and other bookstores in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, bad stories about Africa by outsiders are dismissed as normal. What should count is the narrative constructed by the Africans themselves. I defend that. But I also defend it should not be about hiding facts, particularly the bad examples we set for ourselves. The xenophobic episodes that occurred in South Africa caught the public opinion across the continent by surprise. Many were quick to remind South Africans about the sacrifices of the continent for their liberation from apartheid in light of such utter dismissal of other Africans' dignity. It was unacceptable that the Pan-African ideal, many said, could be trashed in such a way. Few remembered, however, that similar expulsions or beatings of fellow Africans occurred with declared government support in at least 15 African countries before. Arguably, the largest mass expulsions took place in Nigeria in 1983 and again in 1985 when three million West Africans were beaten all the way to the borders. So the expulsion of Africans by fellow Africans is not just a South African issue. It is a recurrent African problem. Fellow Africans have been mass expelled from Cameroon, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zambia, Gabon, and more recently, Libya. Africans have been moving around quite a bit. In pre-colonial times, it was often driven by the need to find land for resettlement and fertile land for farming. Colonial regimes altered those movements and the motivations to reflect migratory patterns that reflected political and economic structures imposed by the regimes then. The impact of this remains. Thus, one can argue that the more recent events reinforce the daily struggles that Africans are confronted with due to the absence of the economic and political changes that should have followed the liberation struggle and political transitions. The failure of Africa to provide a reality that complements the aspirations of its citizens reinforces Amilcar Cabral's premonition that the reality for which people exist, indeed the reason why people are willing to fight is to obtain practical things like peace and better living conditions. Ladies and gentlemen, in fact, if we assess the trajectory of the contemporary African state, 
we recognize more Westphalian than Pan-African traits. At the genesis of the Westphalian state are the treaties celebrated in that city in 1648. They mark the recognition of sovereignty based on principles quite different from previous forms of political legitimacy. The Westphalian state was premised on the notion of sovereignty and the exclusion of all external powers in the domestic affairs. Indeed, this premise assumed the presence of a functioning government. There is no need to revisit the full spectrum of developments that ensued to realize that the principle of sovereignty and the way it was imposed was controversial, provoked many wars, including two world wars, but ended up imposing itself in the form of what we now call international community with its myriad of international organizations. The emergence of the current global governance system, the body of existence of the existing international law, and indeed regional institutions, have their foundations on the Westphalian state. All entities that, as latecomers, integrated the established order imposed in the aftermath of the two world wars, found the landscape of international relations defined. All they wanted was to be part of it and claim their share through the recognition of their sovereignty. This was the case, obviously, with post-colonial Africa, who, it has been argued, embraced the Westphalian state in all its totality. This is still the case, but centripetal forces are not helping. The erosion of sovereignty is the new normal, as we know, with international treaties and agreements calling for transnational and global types of interventions, like on climate change. Perhaps one of the most remarkable developments of the last two decades has been the proclivity of the so-called international community to intervene in different countries with social and political rights justifications that go way beyond the humanitarian concepts of the 50s. Every conflict in Africa that relates to the definition of territory or sovereignty or is trying to address the issue of legitimacy or lack of it by a central authority is in fact revisiting the checkered history of the sovereignty principle. A current case in point would be the Burundian government challenging interference from others on what it considers is international affairs or religiously motivated or justified movements fighting for geographical space and independence from central authority, like in Nigeria, Mali, or Libya. Responses from Africa, responses from African institutions have been short-term in nature with scarce analysis of the deep-rooted causes motivating the conflict. This is partly explained by the desire for Africa to be perceived as compliant with the international order so it can move fast into the catching up mode that characterizes the current stage of its international relations. Being Westphalian explains why expulsions are possible and a common African passport is not, despite the Pan-African rhetoric. It is not a South African problem alone. It is the very essence of defining what the true meaning of Pan-Africanism really is today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is against this background that we hear in Africa, as elsewhere, the call for a cosmopolitan view of the world. Cosmopolitanism is a strengthened Western formulation of secularism. The origin of the world alone from the Greek cosmos and polis, signifying the wide and the particular forms of interaction and knowledge, 
tells us how sophisticated a concept it is. Cosmopolitanism presupposes a desire to construct alliances and amplify community relationships by embracing diversity and expanding them to a global scale. It is an ambiguous attempt to reconcile universal values with their unique realities, with the unique realities that subjects construct in specific historical and cultural context. The ambiguity extends to the way it has to translate secularism in an environment where international institutions format rules around individual rights, lessening the community and larger group interpretations of rights. Without us necessarily linking it to the reality of conflicts or to our disappointment with an hypothetical diminishing political agency of Africans in the world stage, the truth is that cosmopolitanism is a source of tension. Globalization is based on interpretations of cosmopolitanism foundation. We are dealing with the tension between general and particular, the former being expressed through globalization and the latter through resurgent nationalism. I would refine by adding religiously motivated con contestation as well. Try as we might, binaries, oppositions, perceived contradictions, call them what you will, are difficult things to escape from as they organize our thoughts and allow us to think through problems. We love these binaries. The real problem with globalization versus national dichotomy is that it can too easily be used by those who are skeptical about globalization. That is because it is easy enough to show that globalization has little significant impact on the resilience of nationalism. The Pan-African ideology, constructed first by the Africans in the diaspora, has remained a strong anchor for the continent's common vision. It is a concept that has traveled well with its ambiguities, not disturbing a common ambition and a common reference to the recent past. It has been reinterpreted many times, if not re-energized, but we all know its limitations when it comes to dealing with the complexity of cosmopolitanism. The shyness, the shyness that African leaders show when migration is a theme, including for other fellow Africans, is disturbing, but not surprising. Still, it does not give us the full story. The adjustment required by Africans to integrate the mainstream international relations exercise a pull factor that has proven more solid than the desire to defend a joint common African agency in all that matters. Ladies and gentlemen, current attacks and intolerance call for an African humanism. Africa cannot forget its rich cultural heritage and struggle for freedom. There is a need for a revival that recovers African identities distorted by colonialism, as well as appreciation for the problems of today, 21st century. These challenges demand the construction of a common African future based on a bold transformative agenda that goes beyond just economic results. Africa has all the necessary and abundant natural and human resources combined with a strong cultural and intellectual heritage to renew a fight for the appropriation of its future. Africa's transformation and its contribution to forging a new humanism will be elusive in the absence of shared freedoms, shared prosperity, and a common citizenship within and across borders. Fighting for such ideals would have certainly mobilized 
Jakes Gerwell. Thank you.